Uh, welcome everybody to the second functional programming brown bag. Um, this one is going to be focusing on closure. Uh, Peter and Andy will be presenting like they did last time for the first functional programming series. Um, we have a couple of quick announcements. The first one is we have a happy hour coming up in two Tuesdays at Highline. And then um, <coughs> next week's brown bag, I think we're going to try to do a show and tell. So details will be coming out for that uh, shortly. But it's bring in something cool and you talk about it. And uh, we're going to get a list going. It's going to be some old school show and tell. Yep. <laughs> Are we thinking like just as many people as possible, like five minutes each? Or like yeah, I mean, we're going to see how many people sign fun. up. Right. Cool. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> Are they allowed in the building? Are you allowed? <laughs> So Peter and Andy, just, just put a vest on him and you're fine. You can go ahead and take it away. All right, I should have an uh, amplification, I think. Yeah, no? Yeah, uh, picture. Uh, All right, sorry. Yeah. Cool. So um, uh, the obligatory XKCD getting out, out of the way right on the first slide here. Um, basically, we're going to talk about parentheses all day. Um, uh, there's a reason people uh, like this. Um, we're going to talk about some of those reasons. Uh, there's a reason we're talking about closure specifically. We'll also go into some of those reasons. Um, but uh, without further ado, let's go to the next slide. So list. When we talk about a list, what is a list? It's so, old. Uh, 1958 was pretty much the first list-like thing, which is uh, only a year younger than Fortran. So it has the reputation of being the second oldest line of languages that uh, exist and are still in current use. Uh, it's dynamically typed for the most part. Uh, there are ways around it, but uh, the type system of a Lisp is uh, flexible, uh, very flexible. Uh, it is always garbage collected. In fact, even in 1958, they had garbage collectors. Um, a lot of research was done on Lisps to get garbage collection to be not crappy, and it took until about now for them to be adequate enough to support the kinds of computation we want to do and the amount of memory we need to allocate and be allocated. Things like that. Uh, it is prefix notated. You will notice that things are kind of weird. Um, it's also called uh, forward Polish notation. Uh, anyway, and it's uh, functional, which is why we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, so list again, specifically closure. There's its little logo. There's also another cool logo for closure script, which I did not include for lack of time. Um, all lists have what are called special forms. Um, basically, anything you're going to run in a list is called a form, and um, these special forms. Uh, are basically uh, yeah, somewhat congruent across all lists. They're always going to have these kinds of special forms. We're going to be talking about closures, exact special forms. If, let, def, do, function, loop and recur, quote, var, and then Java interop. So things like throw, catch. Um, there's a few other like Java things that actually don't you don't care about if you're doing stuff in like closure script. But um, these are basically functions that have to be defined in like C. Like you you can define all the rest of the language in terms of these, but these are what you would write in a minimal interpreter, a minimal compiler, and then you can build the language on top of that. Um, the S expression or the SX is what we are uh, everything in, in, in uh, Lisp is a symbolic expression. Um, basically a hierarchical list of data. It looks kinda like XML without all the angle brackets and without closing statements. Um, as expressions are very easy to parse, which is one of the reasons why this is one of the oldest forms of uh, tree or screw me up here. Which <laughs> 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 is why it's one of the oldest forms of, of language out there. It's very easy to parse. Um, you can write an as expression parser in like a few dozen lines to see uh, and have it not be uh, crashy and bad. Um, and XML is basically like a tag as expression, right? So you have like your at attributes like uh, in HTML, you have like class and ID. Uh, name, value, and all those. Those are just tags on an S expression of like input or A or whatever. Um, so we're going to take another stab at functional purity. It's very important. We're going to hammer this into your head across pretty much every single brown bag we do. So here's a pure function, uh, and it's too tiny to see. But basically, all it does is it multiplies, it takes an n and multiplies it by itself. So it's square. So defin is defined in terms of def, basically defines a function called f takes a parameter called n, and it multiplies n by n. Um, notice it doesn't, like, the compiler will not care uh, when you build this if n is a string. If multiplication is defined on a string, it will go. 
uh, probably won't go in real life, but you could make it go. So this squares n for any n that has multiplication defined. And since it will always return n times n, there's no like outside influence um, affecting the results of that computation. We can actually optimize this function away and store its result in memory forever in uh, a hash map. Uh, we brought this up before. So actually, here's an implementation of that. Um, I'm doing a little bit more tricky of a function here. Oh. So you, you said that that was described in terms of depth. Yeah. Can you go into just really briefly depth for step on? So all depth does is defines a variable in the global or in the in the local lexical scope that you're in, because you may be like inside of an S expression and only survives like the scope it's in, right? It's not like JavaScript where you can just be like, ah, hello all and you know define stuff whatever. Or PHP, God, God help you. Um, and and so you you're in some scope, you can define things in that scope, and you can bind values to those. So because it's a functional language, functions are also values. You could have theoretically written that this particular, in fact, this is why I have a REPL open, because of people like Western. So here, we can define f, and then we can run f of 2. We get 4. Ah, ta -da. Um, we can also define f as a function that takes an n and multiplies n by n. And then, uh, ta -da. So uh, you normally can't redefine things. Uh, you can in the REPL because it, it knows you're trying to do crazy stuff, but that's that's how it's defined. Defin is actually a macro, which we'll get into. But yeah, that, that's how it works. So it's, you're basically defining a value called f that takes that is a function that takes an argument, uh, length one or arity one, call it n. We actually bind it to the name n, and then we multiply it. Uh, so here I'm doing a little bit more complicated of a of a thing here. Basically, what we're doing is we're saying um, I'm defining a function that takes an n and it uh, adds that n to um, all of the numbers. I'm sorry. It takes that n and then adds all of the numbers from 1 to a million to it, and then just keeps adding it. So it reduces over that, and then it returns a number at the end of the day. Since plus is a function here, um, it doesn't care about argument. Um, you don't have to like supply with arguments or anything. It just is a function, so you can just pass it in. And you can see the time it takes pardon me, to, uh, to execute, to, uh, 17 milliseconds for the first run, six and a half for the second run, probably at hot spots doing some stuff. But now what we can do is we can uh, memoize f, we'll call it f prime. And so the first run of f prime with the same value took a little bit longer. I mean, you're talking about three milliseconds-ish. Uh, and that, that might be some overhead from memoize, but look at the second run. That second run is, uh, is fractions of a millisecond, two hundredths of a millisecond, much, much faster then the second run of f, Hotspot cannot uh, do that kind of optimization. So because we know that uh, this entire function is uh, pure, we can just, just optimize the entire thing away and just not do it ever again. Now you make a trade-off, right? We're eating up memory for that. Um, but I mean, whatever. You know, If this were like a really heavy computation, it's worth it, absolutely. You've got to make the trade-off, but it's easier to make the trade-off when everything is functionally pure. Um, so this strategy holds for every single referentially transparent function, uh, but like there's no uh, unless you don't have enough memory to calculate it for some or to hold it for some reason. Uh, um, so we got Billy Mays here telling us there's some more. Uh, it's also good for testing. So when you test a refer referentially transparent function, you can do cool things like say generate every single possible input that it could ever get and test them and make sure it succeeds. Um, this particular instance here actually just verifies that uh, sorting a vector, and these vectors are generated randomly, it's all random, uh, the, that sorting a vector is the same as sorting the sort of a vector. It, so it should be item, an item potent uh, operation. Sorting of a sorted vector should do nothing, right? And so it, it does this check, it, t it does all sorts of random uh, values into it, uh, generates a vector of some weird length, of some you know random length, doesn't matter. And then it just tests it out 100 times. Uh, and you can see the results here uh, in this comment. So that's pretty cool. It's really easy to test uh, functional functions. Uh, methods and things where you have to like set up structure, set up uh, deterministic like like state for it, and then per, like progress that state through, and then do a teardown step. None of that has to happen for a functional program. And there's even more. Uh, it's also good for parallelism. So uh, I, I took my little squaring function there, and I map it over uh, every single number. Um, that iterate inc one basically generates the natural numbers. 
or I say, okay, I want to take the first million of those and uh, run F on it. That actually took, takes a while. But if you do it uh, in the second one, it uses however many processors I have minus one, I believe. And it just goes to town and paralyzes it. I don't have to do anything except add the letter P. Um, and I'm assured that that's safe because I'm writing a pure function and it doesn't care about, um, you know, oh, am I managing mutexes or locks or any of that? I don't care. Right? It doesn't care. I can just do it. So that's really nice. Um, we can get into a little bit more complicated uh, concurrency uh, primitives like software transactional memory. Um, this looks like a lot of code. Nah, I guess it is. But it's, it's actually doing some interesting stuff. It is taking some number of vectors with some number of items in each vector. You're talking how many threads it should try and run. And you're saying how many iterations it should, it should go through. And you're basically taking all of that information and generating uh, some vectors with these, these numbers in them. And then what it does is it parallelizes. Uh, that's what this P calls does here. It parallelizes functions that will uh, basically uh, change the interior of these vectors in a functional way uh, using the software transactional memory to do automatic retry if you have a collision. So basically, it's like compare and swap. You know, you look at the value, you try and do something to it. If the value changed underneath it, you do it again. And um, it, it just works. It, you don't have to worry about managing locks or, again, uh, mutexes or any sort of critical sections or anything like that. Uh, monitors are handled for you. And this, the, the code that does all the work is, is this little chunk here. You open a transaction, you do the stuff, and you know, you're done. All the rest of it is just setting up variables. So it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, little thing. And actually, I can actually run it for you if you want to see it. Um, basically it generated uh, these lists and then um, these vectors technically and then mutated them and split them into the uh, uh, different different groupings based on the parameters I passed in. I know it's not really sexy looking but th this is this is like bank account grade uh, concurrency. So it's, it's good stuff. There's some good papers about software transactional memory. Um, and uh, if, if you're curious or interested in how that works, I can, I can uh, go over it with anybody who wants to see it. But it's basically like a, a database to do this for multi-version concurrency control. Um, SQL Server does this, for instance, to uh, resolve locks on uh, contention on uh, rights. Um, so that looks complicated, but it was doing a lot of work. And the STM mechanism with the pure functions allows us to not have to worry about concurrency <coughs> at all, which is all right, well, pretty much. So, to move forward, keeping all that in mind, um, in, in, this, in this big example here, you see these let clauses, right? So what is that actually doing? And I, and I want to talk about it because it's actually very important for basically every functional programming language from here on out. Um, let is a, a binding a variable to some result of either a function or just a value, right? So in, in this case here, you can see we're letting v1 be a random integer of the number of vectors we're passing in, right? Um, v2 again, v3, and so it's basically saying like v1 is this random integer or uh, random in uh, vector, if you could call it that. So uh, what I'm going to show you here is that uh, let is lambda, and it's actually really important for uh, you know making sure that we're still functional. So Here's, here's two equivalent functions. You can see I've got a let here. Uh, and I'm letting q equal the result of j times 100. And then I just return q. So basically all f does is take j, multiply it by 100, and return it. This is a really contrived example. You would never do this. But this is equivalent to this h function, which takes a k, which inside of itself has a function that just accepts a k and multiplies it by 100 and returns this result. So it's the same thing. There's actually proof of this. Um, it's called an eta reduction or an eta conversion. Um, you can always do this. You can always do it one way or the other way. And actually, this is really important in proving certain principles about functional programming. Um, 
it's good to know because you can always convert between a let and a lambda. So there's some times where you may want to um, let variables be a certain way, or sometimes where you may want to extract them into a function. That's actually something you could automate. Um, there's automated ways of doing that. Uh, so for things like uh, refactoring. Uh, so it also shows us that let is functional. So we're not violating purity just because we want to name something uh, a name and bind it in a scope. Um, there's many other abstractions that are kind of like this, but this one is extremely important, and so I wanted to bring it up before we get into this tail file elimination and optimization. So um, if you remember from the first brown bagger, if you weren't there, uh, the primary form of iteration in any functional programming language is based on recursion. You may not actually see the recursion happening. You may have some syntactic sugar or some other mechanism to uh, hide the recursion, but recursion is the theoretical fundamental basis of your iteration over collections or uh, whatever. Um, so it won't always recursion blow up your stack, especially on the JVM where you don't have uh, native tail call optimization built in. Um, so yes, you, if you do something naively, you may destroy your stack, um, your call stack. So for instance, this particular function de declares a factorial event. It's pretty simple. If n is 0, return 1. Otherwise, multiply the factorial of n decremented, so dec of n. Remember I said that everything is prefix notation, so dec n de decrements n by 1 multiply by n. Unfortunately, this guy is not optimizable, and he will die. Uh, you'll get a stack overflow error at exactly that number on my machine. Um, on different JVMs, you'll get different numbers. In ClojureScript, you'll get a different number. But that is uh, through my own little uh, kind of ghetto binary search, I found the, <laughs> the number that caused the stack overflow. Um, now, this is optimized. This will not cause a stack overflow. But look, now, now we're doing all this crazy. You know, There's a loop, and we're actually binding things up at the top in the loop to values. We're setting up an accumulator so we can sit there and loop over it. But you know what? We're not going to blow up the stack. This actually will optimize the way that that, jump, that, uh, that call into what's called a jump. So um, for those of you who like assembler, instead of a call where you're growing the stack for all the variables you're putting on the stack, you're actually doing a jump to the, the original instruction. And uh, you just you're not building a stack, so you'll never overflow. And this could go on forever. And you, you can calculate the fact of whatever number you want, and as long as you're willing to wait or you have enough RAM, it will do it. Um, however, this is ugly, and so we have more or less two ways of doing things. Uh, we can actually reduce over, uh, just bear with me, you, you get used to this kind of thing, but we reduce over uh, all of the positive numbers where we decrement n, we multiply it by 1, or because uh, multiplication the operator, the function itself, can take any, any number of arguments. We just apply multiplication to the same like list of, of numbers descending. And it's the same result. And there is no stack being kept track of. And you don't have to worry about accumulators or anything like that. It just happens. Can I maybe show like some of the, uh, in the REPL, some of the internal, like the smaller pieces of that build up? Yeah, sure. So, um, all right, so let's, I'm going to copy this. I like this one. This one's kind of so. Okay, there's fat. Um, so we could do like fat of like something number. Oh, and I forgot that uh, we actually have to. Uh, trick it because everything is. Probably a pretty big number. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, look, I'm not running out of stack. It's probably on some crazy number right now. Who knows? Um, yeah, let's make it a little smaller. Better. That's, that's a big enough number. Um, and that like never ends. So, um, and I didn't run out of stack. Now, if I were to define factorial uh, naively, it would have died way before it got to 10,000. So, uh, let me tear it apart, like Andy was asking me to do. So. Uh, Let's let's do something interesting. Let's define H. We'll get rid of. Unfortunately, I don't have this thing set up where it like automatically like splices. Uh, nah, let's do this. So H of 10 just gives us a list descending because I said take while it's positive. Pos is a function with the little question mark that says is this number positive, and take while will take a uh, a sequence of of whatever and uh, apply that first function to it. And, and once that function becomes false, it will stop. 
Uh, this gets really important in the next section we're going to talk about. So what if I just say, um, if, I, if I change this a little bit, <coughs> OK, well, let's, let's cheat here. If I just do Ah, oh, come on. Sorry. We're just telling it to make a function that always returns true. Trying to be clever, but clever is bad. <laughs> It'll never finish because it's always trying to get the next decremented number. And so that's an important detail um, that we'll be getting into very soon. So um, that's how it's built up. And then reduce is, the, is, is reduced, right? You're saying I have an operator, so multiplication, or a uh, function, it doesn't really matter. The function takes two arguments. Multiplication and closure can take n arguments, but it, it takes at least two, right? Because you need to multiply two things together. And so the first thing it does is it says, okay, I've got a one. I get the first value of this, multiply it. I get the second value of this, multiply it. I get the third value of this, multiply it, until this runs out. And then it reduced over the whole thing. Now, reduced has some interesting features too, which we won't worry about right now. But um, do you even need reduced since multiplication? No, you can apply. And actually, you could. Just you, Yes, start with multiply. Because <coughs> you can take a list as arguments. Yeah, but you don't. You need to apply. You can't just multiply by random list arguments. Because you need to apply by the function. Yeah. So, anyway, the, the, the core takeaway from this one, and leads into the next section, is if you can think of your data as sequences, uh, you have a wealth of these functional operators to work with. And so now we're going to talk about immutable data structures, which uh, is, is part of like part and parcel to how closure is so popular. Um, so we have map, and so map is kind of overloaded term. You have a mapping between two values, so like a key and a value. You also have map as like uh, apply this uh, function to a set of input, which is actually basically the same thing if you think about it conceptually. But um, I just want I'm just kind of showing you that um, I made a map called M and it has an apple at the keyword A. So this is like Ruby. Ruby has these like naked keywords. Closure has them to all this because I believe have them. Um, so this is B, it's a banana. And if I say M, uh, you know, evaluate M, apple, banana. Uh, commas are optional in closure, which is awesome. Um, you don't think you miss it until you miss it. Um, a so or a so uh, is associating M at index C, so index being a key in a map with carrot. So now I've got apple, banana, carrot. But if I evaluate M, it didn't actually change M. It made a new map, um, we could have called it N or whatever, that has carrot in it. So uh, that's actually really important because we can always hold on to M, do stuff to it, try things out maybe. Um, there's all sorts of uh, cool things you can do um, where you don't have to worry about M being changed out from under you. And uh, you don't have to be defensive about holding on to M. You actually have to be defensive about not holding on to M. But that's another <laughs> story for another day. But if you if you all if you get an M, you can always be assured that M is not going to change for out from under you. Now you can keep on uh, keep on trucking with whatever you got. Um, the vector behaves in a similar way. Uh, there's a vector one two three. If I conj uh, the vector with the number four, jams it onto the back. If I associate the vector with in position zero with the number zero, it just replaces it. But v, I didn't show this, but V was never touched. These are all new vectors coming back. And you might think, well, that's kind of slow. And it can be. However, there's uh, been a lot of research into things called HAMPs or hash-based array mapped trees. Uh, tree being tri, tree, whatever. It's a prefix tree. Um, both Closure and Scala and a few other languages actually use HAMPs for these persistent maps and sets. Persistent being immutable, can't change them. Um, vectors have 32 way branching, so access, updates, all these other things are both log 32 of n, which is basically O of 1 um, for the most part. Log32 is a tiny number, uh, log32 of n. So uh, there's an interesting paper on these upgrades to these HAMPs that's called CHAMP. Uh, I linked it down here. Uh, this is a whole crazy set of data structures. Uh, I recommend, if you're really interested in how these things work, data structures are interesting to you. If you liked reading CORS or any of those other books, uh, check this out. It's a pretty cool, uh, uh, basically, uh, implementation of 
immutable data structures so that you are not getting killed with performance every time you're copying them uh, as you're you know, working on you know, different uh, iterations of them. Um, so there's structure sharing, which is, which is part of the reason HAMPs are so good, is because they actually share pieces of the structure internally. Um, so just because we made a map that had an apple and a banana and then we added a carrot, um, that doesn't mean the apple and the banana map went away. We actually basically did a bunch of pointer tricks under the table and under the covers that um, made it look like there was a new map, apple, banana, carrot. But in reality, there were two maps, apple, banana, and you don't see that one anymore. Uh, somebody else can see it. And then you see apple, banana, carrot because you've done this, this update to the operation, uh, to the map uh, that, you, that has now replaced the value you had before. But if you leave your scope, that old value is still valid. It's, it's kind of an interesting uh, thing to check out. But basically, it clings on to the unchanged pieces of the structure and does like pointer tricks to figure out, OK, well, wherever the change is, where I'm just going to reach out here and, and do a little bit of changing. And so there's, there's some, there's some hardware-based things here. Like there's a reason it's OLOG32 because of cache lines. There's a reason um, they try and uh, optimize for the machine that you're targeting. Uh, I know the JavaScript version of Clojure, so ClojureScript does a little bit differently uh, the way that they deal with, with arrays and things like that um, under the covers. Because you know all the JavaScript has is a collection is an array. Yeah? So you're saying if you had changed that um, that value of A instead of apple, you'd made it avocado or something yeah. like that. So the, the new associ array that you got out of that, or that, that map, that would have still had apple in it? Well, the, so it would have had apple, apple to anything that observed it outside of that scope. Right. So when, when you make a chain, so Lisp reads like English, left to right, top to bottom. So as you're going down, if you're in a scope, just like you'd be in a function scope in Java or whatever, if you were to change the value of a map inside of that scope, that change will persist through that scope. But as soon as you leave that scope, that change had not, like almost never happened, unless you return that value somehow. Right? If you say, this map is leaving, so like if you were, if you were going to alter the map and then return it as, as the return value of your function, that is the only way that modification can leave that scope. Does that does that help kind of clarify? Generally, so if you so if you made a change under the hood, like that initial structure that you were uh, that this was based off of, if anything changed in the underlying or the underlying structure or the object that, that it was extending, basically, would that have to basically restructure the? Piece yeah, again? and so that's not even allowed. <laughs> so it's, it's That's kind of like version control and tagging, yep. conceptually, where you have all these versions of mm -hmm. your, the, you know, the, the piece of memory. I had a variable called foo, or you know, I have apple, and I have banana, and I have carrot, and there's one thing that's pointing to apple and banana, right. and there's another one that's pointing to apple and banana carrot. Apple yeah. carrot, and one that might point to apple carrot. That's They're all, they all exist, yeah. okay. but you can be pointing to different slices of it. Yep. So you can actually disassociate pieces, like you could remove the banana or whatever, and this would be apple carrot inside of your scope. But then as soon as you leave, you never changed that original right. map. And so as soon as you leave that scope, and that scope, could, you could be way down inside of something, bad programming practice, but you could be like inside of a nested set of functions or a nested set of let bindings, for instance, which are functions, remember, let is lambda. Uh, you could be all the way inside of one of those things, do a change, and then as you exit, if you never propagate that out as the return value of any of those functions, it's like it didn't happen. Right. Okay. So this is basically just computing a bunch of changes on top of... Yeah, uh, so you pay a penalty there, right? right. And there's, there's actually a, a nice paper uh, by a guy named uh, Dan Okasaki, uh, uh, one of my favorite papers. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a PhD thesis, and it's actually really accessible for a, for a CMU PhD thesis uh, called uh, Functional Data Structures. And he, uh, he goes over all these different cool data structures in ML. So it's more like Haskell. But um, he talks about um, how, how to do any of the data structures you can think of that you would be using on a daily basis. There are functional counterparts to those. And he talks about what's called amortized uh, uh, runtime complexity. right? Because you you're actually do pay a penalty at certain points because you have to do certain restructurings or things like that. But you, like for instance, in HashMap, when you rebalance the map or you have to resize it because you've hit the load capacity, you're paying an amortized cost there too. It's not O of 1 insert. It's O of 1 plus some nasty amortized value when you're resizing the memory. So it's the same thing. If you, if you're, again, if you're really interested, don't do it if you're just partially interested. If you're really interested, 
It's about an 80 page thesis. It's very good. He actually turned it into a book. I, I like the thesis better than the book because it's, it's just raw and it's right there. Yeah. The book has like all this other garbage. So uh, I, I like the, and the thesis costs zero dollars and the book costs whatever. Um, buy his book so he can support him. Right, he's probably rich. Just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so a lot of pointer math and trickery is hidden from view because this immutability uh, empowers our tools, so the language, to perform these optimizations without us even, you don't have to be aware of it. And so one instance of this is this database called Datomic. Uh, Justin's not here, of course. I was going to make that. So Datomic is, uh, is a database. Um, uh, I, I thought I had another slide about it, but I don't. Datomic is a database that basically um, supports this immutable data store as a database. You, you, for the most part, there are caveats. You will never overwrite a value in the database. You will always, it's an append only, basically. So you're looking at things like event sourcing, um, models. This is similar. Um, things are versioned. The only invariant in the database is time. So you can say, all right, database, what was your value at time, some Unix timestamp? And it will say, okay, here was my value at that time, or at some transaction number, or whatever. Uh, and it will return you the value of the database at that um, uh, at that that time slice or that transaction number that you specified, which is really interesting because now you don't have to worry about like the provenance of of, of, of like changes across your data. You can just say, okay, well, you can actually query it and say, okay, well, tell me about all the changes that happened to this piece of data, and we'll hear the transactions that had done it. So it is like version control, um, except it is backed by these immutable data structures. Um, the implementation details are pretty cool, if you care. Um, a lot of things about AWS in there, there's like writers and readers, and um, uh, the, the data log uh, query language is pretty cool just by itself. Uh, like understanding data log by itself is probably like a half a year project for somebody who's interested. Uh, but it's a very cool database. Um, the concepts are cool. It works uh, very fast. Um, you know, read heavy. Um, writes are pretty quick, but again, eventual consistency and things like that kind of kick in there. Um, so one thing you do need to do though is you need to pay attention. You need to know the runtime cost of accesses to your immutable data structures because it does matter. Vectors are most easily grown from the tail. If you want to add something to the front of a vector one time, it's fine. You do it a million times, it sucks. It will hurt you because of the way the data structure is built. Lists are most quickly grown from the front. So appending something to the front of a list is a very easy operation, O of one. You append it to the end, you have to traverse the entire list until you get to the tail. Um, so all of n, that sucks. You do it a million times, well, n times, you know, whatever. Uh, maps are just maps, so it's O of one-ish. Um, there's a function in uh, Clojure called conj, which means conjoin. Uh, it does the right thing always, which means things can get a little tricky. If you assume that things are going to be in the front or the back, but you don't know what data structure you're working on because it's, you know, abstracted away as some interface, uh, you you. Don't, don't rely on like the locality of the data inside the data structure, you just need to add things to it. So it, it, you, there's a penalty there, right? You have a little bit of a cognitive overhead um, on that data structure. But I believe, and I think a lot of other people do that, it's absolutely worth the trade-off. And you can always get erased. Like you could, you, there are mutable arrays in culture. If you're like, I, I need to do mutable stuff, you can't just do it. So I want to talk about lazy sequences. Um, uh, my, one of my favorite pictures on the internet is, uh, is a sloth here, an astronaut. So, Clojure has this thing called a seek. Um, I, I want to make a distinction here. Scala also has a seek. They are totally different. So, and uh, Haskell also has a seek, which is also different. So, um, I hate this this kind of like overload of terms, but just you're going to have to bear with it because they're different languages and they do different things. So, uh, a seek. It's just an interface, and it only has three operations. First, which in most lists was called car, or the contents of the address register. Rest, which is the tail of the list, right? Which is the cutter, or the contents of the decrement register, which is like, they're named that for historic reasons, but car and cutter, if you like get into scheme, or you get into uh, common list for some other of these, thing, uh, these things, that's, that's how they, they're the same thing. And then cons, which is the same across all of them, which constructs a new list, or a new C, sorry. And so you can see I make a new seek out of any collection. Seek of one, two, three is just a sequence of one, two, three. The first of seek of one, two, three will get the first element, so it'll be one. The rest will be two and three. If I cons one onto a seek containing two and three, I get one, two, three. And then this is the same as this, right? Cons one to cons two and cons three to the empty list will construct a new seek with three elements in it, one, two, three, in that order. And that's where you can see why it's easier uh, on a 
seek is like a list of how it's, how it's easier to add to the front and you're not paying the operation because you're just taking the existing structure and embedding it in you know, with, with the new list. Yeah. And so what's interesting about that is those are all functions and they don't have to be applied uh, when you start uh, you know, doing stuff. So you may have partial application of a seek um, that you may never get to the end of, right? For instance, I actually showed you a, a, a trick um, where I was generating every single number ever, but I was only taking 10 of them or whatever. Uh, so you can, you can uh, make what we would call like a generating function, have a generator or have some source of data that is infinite, uh, maybe your key presses or bits on a network stream or whatever, and uh, you just take what you need. Hence the laziness. We are lazy about evaluating what is in that data structure. So here, um, I'm doing, I'm, I'm just, this is a little stupid toy, but I open up a reader to you random. You can see Java leaking in here. Um, I don't know exactly how to do this in ClojureScript, but there is a way. Um, I will then, uh, I then define another, uh, so I, I open a stream, defs, there's a stream, or it's actually a reader, but it doesn't matter. I then say, um, so I have this thing called rands, takes that, that takes an argument n, and it takes n, so n times, repeatedly applying this read function to s. This, this hash means uh, everything inside of here is a new function. Um, this is shorthand. So this is a function, read s, so it pulls that s from its environment and brings it in. <laughs> Technically, I could have passed s here, but whatever. Um, because it's all in the same scope, it doesn't matter. Again, lat equals lambda. We could, we could have rewritten this to bring s in. Um, taking n, uh, it means take the first n of the elements that are uh, coming out of whatever this is, right? So if I say rands of five, it'll give me the first five random numbers from dev u random, which I've been having a little bit of issue with because u random's been behaving strangely, but let's uh, let's give it the old college try and we'll see what happens. Um, it doesn't, doesn't seem random to me, but we'll, we'll do it. So there's like 10 random numbers. And it doesn't, I mean, I don't know what the hell 65, 533 is, but it happens a lot. Um, I, I think it means that u random is buffering, I would imagine. We, I mean, we could actually filter those out. Okay. I'm not going to do it. Um, take 100, I could take 1,000, take 10,000, I could take, you know, ah, let's keep going. You know, I probably exhausted my entropy pool there, but uh, it's just, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. I didn't, I didn't have to tell it, you know, um, oh, I, got, I actually, <laughs> actually got to close. Oh, you know what? There was, a, there was another thing. So, map can operate, and same, same with reduce, and same with all these other functional operators, can, can operate on lazy sequences. So if I just say, uh-oh, uh-oh, I made him mad. Sorry, we'll, we'll hide here for a second. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually am telling it, um, I just want you to read five rands, and then partial says, take the next function, take the first value from it. Remember I was talking about currying in the last one? This curries the function or partially applies the function in the first uh, argument with the value in the second argument, third argument, fourth argument. However many arguments it takes minus however many you don't want to give it. So it returns a new function that is basically multiplying me by two. So what, and, and it takes one value. Um, there we go. So it just multiplied all the numbers by two that it got from, from RANS. So I, and, and again, I can make RANS you know, 50 and it just does it. Uh, and, and MAP will uh, exhaust RANS. So however long RANS lives, uh, MAP will, will keep going. If RANS never finishes, MAP never finishes. Yeah. Um, the output of RANS isn't a lazy list. Is that correct? Right, because uh, when you take, you're, you're, you're forcing evaluation of n of those. Um, so you're right. The only lazy piece is technically repeatedly. Repeatedly will never stop. Uh, it will always try and, and fulfill uh, something from reading it. So yes, the, the only truly lazy piece here is this repeatedly. Um, but since you random is always being fed, or almost always being fed with entropy, uh, you can always take from it. So yeah. Um, and then reduce, you can, can do the same thing. All these functional operators that operate on seeks can do this with lazy seeks. Now you have to be careful because you can be in an infinite loop. Uh, you can also get into situations where if you never evaluate things, um, they may never execute. So if you're trying to be tricky and putting a, uh, a side effect inside of something that evaluates lazily, it may never actually happen. 
Um, so if you're like trying to like debug this and like put if you put a print inside this repeatedly and you never actually evaluate it, it will never print. So you may be like, well, what the hell? I'm trying to figure out what's going on in here and it's never calling it. Well, because you're never calling it. So something you have to keep an eye on. Um, it's just you know it's one of those things. So uh, my favorite part of, of closure and uh, why I saved it for last is uh, <laughs> macros. List macros are awesome. So here's when you think of macros, this is what you think of. C. <laughs> uh, this is my favorite gift right now. <laughs> C macros um, are garbage. Uh, macros in basically every other language are, are no good, but macros in Lisp are awesome. And you open a vial of champagne when you start using them, and you don't overuse them. You can't overuse them. So I'm going to give you an example of why they're so good. Um, there's this when macro. So when, remember I said there's those special forms. If, do, let, blah. When is defined in terms of if, but it's kind of interesting. So uh, when allows you to say, all right, um, we're doing something over a sequence. We're saying give me 0 to 10. Uh, and assigning it to x, so this is a, a left binding basically. So x is a variable inside of here. When x is even, print x. That's really all it does. Um, so it's kind of, uh, you can do other things inside that that when, and um, they actually kind of, if you look at the hierarchical structure of a Lisp program, it's not perfectly nested. You could you could keep adding things. And that first form inside the when is the predicate, right? the condition under, under which the when executes. Everything else is inside it is, is in a body. You technically need to wrap that in something, but one lets you be, be special because this is such a uh, useful uh, condition that when will actually rewrite the code on the fly to support what you're trying to do. So this is a little bit funky, but what it does is it, the macro actually takes the, the first form it gets, and then that ampersand means everything else, right? So you're, you're actually defining a function that takes all of its pieces. So body is going to be, sorry, I went the wrong way. Body is going to be pern x here, but you could have other, other stuff in there, and that would fill that body. So body is a list. Test is, is, man, damn it, is, <laughs> is this even x, right? And so it says, all right, I'm going to rewrite this code as if test, then do the body. So do is a special form that allows you to compose um, forms as if they were one big form. So you can have perfect nesting. Um, so this is pretty cool. You don't have to write do uh, all over the place when you're using when. When is everywhere. If you look at the closure standard library, that everything is when. Um, so this is kind of weak, though. You're like, oh, well, that's stupid. Um, and if you, it, there's actually a, a thing called macro expand where you, you give it what a macro is. Like, uh, I want you to tell me what this macro is, and it will show you it rewritten. So this is the macro, and then it rewrote it to this. So it's actually rewriting the code on the fly. And since your code is data, uh, you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. So con, this is interesting, right? So con takes an even number of forms. First form, if that's true, does returns or evaluates the, the second form. The third form, if it's true, evaluates the third, the fourth form. The fifth form, if it's true, evaluates the sixth form, and so on and so forth. Con is not a special form. It's actually defined in terms of if. So let's take a look. There's the macro for con. Now, it actually is literally on the fly rewriting your code to, to if statements. Uh, you don't have to do anything special here. And it, it obviously checks and sees con requires an even number of forms. So if you try and call con with like seven forms, it will die. Um, during this step, but um, and then it, it actually continues to macroize itself down. So uh, this is what happens when you keep expanding it, right? Uh, you, you know, you don't have to worry about what's going off the screen here, but you macro expand the first one, and you macro expand the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and then it finally there's no more code. So it's pretty cool. And you can actually uh, in certain lists there are macros that go the other way, where you can actually redefine the syntax of the language. So you could actually like implement uh, C, for instance inside of Lisp and then just like run it. Um, Closure doesn't let you do that. It, it only allows you to do these kinds of macros where it, uh, it will rewrite the, um, the, the code based on um, like a, obviously a program that you can write in Lisp. Um, so uh, that's about it for Closure, although I did have a couple more things I wanted to point out. One of my favorite libraries is Reagent. Um, so this is, this is React and ClojureScript. Um, 
So here's a, here's a React component in ClojureScript. Um, you know, it's, this is this hiccup syntax, which is probably kind of off-putting at first, but this is a data structure. Again, so you can modify it and do whatever you want to it. You can evaluate things inside of it. Um, you can uh, include other components inside of your component, and so it'll do its thing. Uh, you can, you know, make a list by saying for all the item in items. You got to put this key in there. Uh, in JSX, I believe you need to, you know, tell React that uh, hey, that these these are a list of items, and here's the here's the IDs for them, or I forget what they're called. There's keys here. You don't have to do it, but it's good practice. Here's the items. Um, Blah, 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 managing state. So like you can just click this thing and it increments the counter. Here's the code that does that. The entire code, this is it. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, keeps track of how many seconds we've been on the page. And uh, there's like a little to-do list at the bottom. Uh, let's calculate how bad I am. Um, let's see, what's the to-do list? Uh, so you can see like it's, it's pretty, pretty, Type for a to-do list, right? I mean, this is this is it. Going to that, yeah, just runs itself, and then as a to-do list, you can, can add things, delete things, check them off. All that. So uh, that's one. And then the second thing I wanted to show you uh, that Closure uh, has kind of as a feather in its cap is core.async. Um, so asynchronous programming is annoying. I'm sure a lot of you have used different libraries to try and achieve it. Core.async has a really interesting principle that was, uh, as pretty much everything else is, is kind of developed in the 70s and finally discovered again, you know, pretty recently. Uh, communicating sequential processes, a guy named uh, C-A-R-4, uh, H-O-A-R-E, that uh, he's also named Tony. I think his first name is Carmichael, Antonio something. Anyway, he uh, won the Turing Award, and he was a researcher at Microsoft, and he came up with this concept of uh, communicating sequential processes. This is a um, implementation of that. So you open a channel, you can tell the channel how big it is, close the channel, you can pump data into the channel, you can pump data into the channel and make sure it's you get it back out of the channel. So there's all sorts of different cool things. But basically this lets you do, especially for those of you who have written a lot of like jQuery where you have like Ajax, 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 you know, like callback help. Uh, this allows you to abstract that callback into a channel and then have things basically sequentially execute as the channels continue to feed uh, values inside of themselves. Closure made it very easy for this concept to exist. This go statement here is actually a macro that enforces certain uh, things happen inside of itself to make sure the environment is correct for it, that uh, things are occurring correctly. There's other macros uh, that go along with this to make sure that uh, you're not doing anything wrong. But it's a pretty cool library that um, uh, I think it's worth checking out, even, even just to try and understand the concepts underneath it. Um, Akka uh, is another good library that... Um, go routines as well. Like yeah, go routines, yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, questions? I also have a REPL, so we can do all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah? Um, I noticed in the examples of the macros, um, uh, the output was created uh, using you know, lists and cons and stuff. Does yep. Clojure have like the, like, the fat tick? Shortcuts that I don't think it has the comma operator, but it does have the back tick. It also has uh, four. So if you have like a sequence, like, again, if you have a seek and you're bringing it in for some reason, it actually has a, uh, an operator to partially like or evaluate that sequence and then escape out of the sequence to start writing code and then escape back into the sequence to do um, not code writing, I guess, and continue to like modify values in the sequence or whatever. So if you look at the standard library code, would they be uh, yeah, yeah, you want to, if you're actually, cons and stuff. sure, you want, if you want to take a look, oh, let me do the, uh, where the hell's my mouse, okay. so we can actually go, ah, cool, this is actually kind of where I wanted to be, so we can actually take a look at uh, core, so this is a, I will not claim that this is the best code ever written. Uh, for some reason, Rich Hickey um, has his way of doing things. Uh, so here, here's a pretty comp, well, this is actually def macro itself. Uh, there's when, there's when not. 
There's con. Lazy seek. Uh, delay. Sorry, I'm trying to find an instance of that. It's actually sequencing a list. Yeah, here. So, no, that's not a list either. No, here we go. So, this, this particular macro loops over all the forms that you've given it. So, this is the thread macro. This is actually pretty neat. It allows you to say, like, function one, whatever your result is, is the first argument of function two, which is the first argument of function three, first argument of function four. It keeps repeating that down the line. So, um, it basically uh, is building a function uh, that does that for you. So, you can see it. Um, is rewriting the code to put x, which I believe is the result of evaluating um, the first form, yeah, uh, and pumping it into the first call. And then this this tilde at is basically uh, macro expanding the second uh, form on and on and on and on until you get uh, you know done. I have a pretty complicated version of this. I can show you later if you want to see. I actually wrote like a spring bean initializer and closure just because it was funny. <laughs> I, I can show you. <laughs> uh, any more questions? No? All right. So um, closure is awesome. Use it. Uh, the next one uh, will be, oh, and I did not do the trumpet. I'm sorry. Um, we wanted to get this in pretty quick. Uh, Ryan said there was a vacancy. so. Uh, I did not have time to write the trumpet, but this is on Bitbucket, so if you, I will write it. So if you want to see how that is implemented in Clojure, um, I can uh, let whoever is interested know, and uh, we'll be up there probably in a week or two. So uh, the next one is going to be Scala, Joel, and Amy. Yeah. Joel and somebody. Joel. Definitely Yeah. <laughs> Joel and somebody. So you'll get another uh, side of the side of the functional programming. Uh, Zoom, yeah, with uh, you know actual types um, and uh, algebras and cool things like that. So uh, anyway, thanks for coming. Thanks for attending. Let me know if you have any questions. You can always hit me up on HipChat, and uh, I'm done.